Hey folks, welcome to another Passion for Sound audio review, or audio reviews in this case, because I'm talking today about the Bayer Dynamic T5 and T1 third generation. Because these headphones share so many similarities, what I thought I'd do was start with all of the things that are the same, and then diverge into talking about each one on its own from a sound quality perspective. So if you're looking for a review on both of these, what you'll need to do is watch this one, and then jump over to the other one, and use the chapter markers in the timeline or the description to jump ahead to the parts that are different. These are headphones that have had a lot of fans, but also a lot of detractors over the years. So I was really interested to see how the new version stacked up to my memory of the original T1s and indeed to other flagship headphones on the market today. Before we jump into the review, I just want to flag that these headphones retail for about 1600 Australian dollars, which equates to roughly 11 to 1200 US dollars. And that's pretty cheap these days for a flagship headphone. So the question for me as I got my hands on these was whether or not they're really good value for money being a flagship headphone at that price or whether they're actually more of a moderate performance headphone that just happens to be at the top of Bay Dynamics range. The T1 and the T5 retail here in Australia for about 1600 Australian dollars, which equates to around 11 to 1200 US dollars. Unlike previous iterations, they now have an impedance of just 32 ohms and a sensitivity of about 100 decibels. So what that means is that they no longer require, in the case of the T1 in particular, the really high voltage amplifiers to get the most out of them. In fact, these are now very non-power hungry headphones. To put that in perspective, both of these headphones only require about 100 to 120 milliwatts to get dangerously loud levels of sound out of them. That equates to an amplifier's output voltage needing to be no more than about 2 volts and about 60 milliamps. So that means you're going to be able to get the most out of these in terms of giving them enough power from something as simple as a portable digital audio player or something like an AudioQuest Dragonfly. All of those will be absolutely fine with both the T1 and the T5. Obviously better quality sources will sound better because it's not just about the amount of power available, but the point here is that both of them don't need a lot of power, so you can focus more on the quality of the source, not how powerful it is. Let's start talking a bit about the accessories and the design of both headphones. Most of this is pretty similar between both headphones, so we'll start this section together before diverging into the sound quality. Both headphones ship with this really nice carry case, it's got like a velour, velvety sort of outer with the Beodynamic logo and you can see from how I'm holding it here it's pretty cavernous there's lots of space there so it's going to take either headphone plus the cable rolled up safely inside it. It's not a small case at all so I doubt people are going to be throwing this in their work bag but certainly if you had professional needs for transporting your headphone around it's nice to have a big case like this that's going to thoroughly protect your expensive headphones. Other than the carry case when you buy either headphone all you're getting is the headphone itself and a cable. In the case of the T1, it's a longer cable than the T5, and that's probably because the T1 is likely to be a desktop headphone. Being an open headphone, it doesn't isolate well, so there's a good chance that it's always gonna be attached to a desktop amplifier. The T5, on the other hand, has a much more manageable shorter cable that could easily be used walking around the house, commuting, in an office, you name it. The cables themselves are the same design other than length, and that means that they're terminated in a 3.5 mil headphone jack, like so, and they come with a 6.3 mil adapter. I do think it's a shame that you're not getting balanced connections at a flagship level like this, but at least it's a detachable cable that you can get an upgrade for if you want to. And speaking of an upgrade, you're going to want an upgraded cable the moment you buy these. Not because the cable's bad quality in terms of its sound, it feels good, it looks good, the connections are all sturdy and stable. The problem is it's wrapped in this coarse fabric. And whenever you're wearing the headphones, they produce the most horrendous amount of microphonic sound back through the cable that it really gets in the way of enjoying the music. I think Beodynamic have made an absolute blunder on this cable, and I really recommend anyone looking at these to go out and get a replacement cable immediately, because I just don't think you're gonna be able to enjoy it. Speaking of the cable, the headphones themselves have the cable entries 
in the bottom here, but angled forward, not majorly forward, so they're not coming straight out at you, but at a slight angle. And that's nice because it means the cable's not coming down, draping over your shoulder. And if you're putting it on a headphone stand, the cable's not going straight down into the desk, but coming out at a slight angle, much more gentle on the cable and also more comfortable for you when you're wearing it. While we're talking headphone design, both of these models use the very familiar Biodynamic design language, which means it's got a simple round cup it's got pads made of either leather in the case of the T5 or velour in the case of the T1, both of which are very, very comfortable. The drivers on the inside are slightly angled towards your ear and that helps with a sense of space and sound stage from the headphones. But interestingly, Biodynamic have implemented this funny sort of foam pad or mesh pad over the top of the driver. It's similar to something I noticed in the DT880s that I reviewed recently, where they're putting this extra layer of padding over the top of the driver that is probably based on a reduction in the treble output. I'll talk about that more when we get to sound quality, but it makes the inside of the cup quite nice and sleek to look at. And if your ears do happen to touch anything inside the cup, which mine haven't by the way, so I'm not suggesting that's a problem, but if they do happen to touch anything in there, it's all very soft and comfortable. Back to the outside of the headphones, we've got the yokes here, which are made again of metal like you'd be used to from the original T1s and T5s. And then you've got a leather clad headband with this nice sort of Alcantara top piece there with the Bay Dynamic logo. So it's all very nicely put together. It feels luxurious, everything's quite comfortable and they feel like a proper flagship headphone. A couple of final points I want to mention though is that I did find a little bit of a hot spot happening as I wore both the T5 and the T1 for any extended period. I'd just get a little patch on top of my head that would get uncomfortable and I'd need to shift the headphone band back or forth a little bit. So it's a minor issue, but I don't find that happening with a lot of my other flagship headphones that I can easily wear for hours at a time. With these, one hour to two hours, somewhere in that window, I was finding myself a little bit uncomfortable just on top of the head. If you've got hair, unlike me, you're probably not gonna have that problem, but for those baldies like me out there, it may be an issue. Another design piece I wanted to talk about was that on the T1s over here, we've got this interesting architecturally inspired hole pattern. So instead of the old fashioned mesh grid, what they've actually got here now is a series of punched holes of slightly different sizes. It's quite a nice geometric pattern. In the case of the T1, it makes sense. I think it looks really sleek and I like the design. Where my problem comes up, and this is purely personal preference, I don't really understand why they felt the need to transfer the same pattern as a printed pattern onto the T5. I actually think it cheapens the look of the headphone. It's unnecessary detailing that generally I think we see on cheaper stuff. Whereas if we just had a really nice matte brushed finish, these could have looked spectacular. Now, as I said, some people are gonna love the way they've done this. I believe the pattern's been made with a brushing treatment, so it's not actually printed or painted on, as I might've just suggested. It's in the actual metal finish itself by the look of it. And so it all depends on how it's reflecting light, whether it looks darker or lighter than the rest of the cup. Either way, I'm not personally a fan, but it is entirely personal preference. You might love it, and it's not a reason to not buy these if you like the sound of them. The only other thing I'll mention while I've got the T5s in hand before we diverge this into separate reviews for the T1 and T5 sound quality is that the T5s isolate really well, whereas as you'd expect from the open T1s, they don't really isolate at all. So if isolation is important to you, obviously the T5s are the ones to look at, but actually the decision-making process between these two could easily be more about the sound because they don't sound as similar as you might think. As you probably guessed, that marks the moment where we split ways and now we'll talk about the sound quality for the T1 and the T5 separately. Don't forget you can always jump over to the other review if you do want to hear about both of them. You think you know
let's talk now about the sound quality of the T1. This is the third generation and I previously owned the original T1 first generation, which had some flaws, but was also still a really enjoyable headphone. So I have to admit that I was actually pretty underwhelmed with the third generation T1. The first generation had all kinds of problems with treble spikes. I actually was one of the many people that came up with a modification for those that did help slightly to just smooth off that treble harshness. But at the same time, I eventually moved on from them because they were an imperfect headphone. They sounded great on some tracks and they sounded really harsh on others. I was excited to see what Bayer Dynamic would do with their third attempt at the T1, but I was pretty much underwhelmed by the results. It's not to say the T1's a bad headphone, I just don't think it's as good as it could have been and should have been. The first thing I noticed is it's been massively tamed from the original T1, and that's a good thing, but it's probably been tamed too far or at least in the taming process where they've taken away the treble, it's like nothing's been given back to reinvigorate the sound when that focal point's been taken away. The third generation is still prone to some sibilance and it's quite a V-shaped sound signature. So the bass has come up, as I understand it, the bass has come up more than on the original T1 and the trebles come down a little bit, but it is still the V-shaped sound. The sound stage is still very good and that was always one of the real selling points of the original T1, but I think it's not quite as big as it was from the original T1. Obviously I don't have the two of them here side by side to compare, but from memory, the original T1 did throw a bigger sound stage at the cost of that treble spike. By taming that treble, the engineers at Bayer Dynamic have reduced the soundstage size, but the good news is it's not gone altogether, it's just not as big as it used to be. The soundstage also features really nice imaging clarity, so mid-range in particular is really well focused in the soundstage, and that makes it an enjoyable listen from a soundstage presentation point of view, but from a frequency response point of view, it did leave me a little bit flat. Finally, talking about the bass, the bass from the T1s has really good presence, it's well defined and it's quite cool. Quick. It doesn't have as much bass as the closed T5 as you might expect, but it still represents bass well within the overall mix. As always, I think a good way to put these things in perspective is to put them up next to a competitor or another headphone that is well known around the industry. So in the case of the T1, I've put them next to my Focal Clears that you can see up here over my shoulder just there. So the Focal Clear and the Biodynamic T1 are very, very different listening experiences. The Clear is immediately a more open sounding headphone and I don't mean that in terms of the openness of the cup, I mean that in terms of the sound stage and the clarity just opens everything up. You can hear more of the music immediately when you go from the T1s to the clears. That's not inherently good or bad, it's just something I immediately noticed. Curiously, the T1 sounds a bit more closed in or a little bit more intimate, and yet as I listened more, the soundstage is thrown further. And I've never experienced that with a comparison of headphones before. So the clear has a smaller stage, but everything's kind of pushed back in that stage away from you a little bit. Whereas the T1 has a bigger overall stage, but certain sounds are closer to you and there's more overall probably separation in the three dimensionality. That's a really nice trait of the T1s that I did really enjoy. Where things went a bit astray for the T1s for me was the overall balance of the sound signature. At first listen, you don't listen to the T1 and think something's off, but when I compared it to the clear, I suddenly realized that what I was hearing from the clear sounded much more natural, much more realistic, even though the clear does tend to have a little bit of treble emphasis and be a little bit metallic at times. The T1 on the other hand just felt a little bit too subdued and controlled and rich and warm without going far enough into that territory to make it a special experience. A big part of that is that when you hear the two of them together, you realize that the upper bass and the lower mids from the T1 are just a little bit too pronounced and it just makes things a little bit unnaturally thick. In fact, what I wrote in my notes was that I think there would be a perfect headphone sweet spot that sits somewhere between the Focal Clears and the Bay Dynamic T1 third gen. 
probably erring slightly more to the clears, but it would almost be an amalgamation of the two. I sometimes wish the clears had a little bit more thickness and richness to their sound, but at the same time, I think the T1/3rd gen's gone too far, and the result is that underwhelming experience. As you'll hear if you watch my T5 review, there is a place they could have gone to that can be quite magical, I just don't think they went there. I think they're stuck in a bit of no man's land and it's not the bright, exciting, engaging sound of the original T1, but at the same time, they haven't found a character that makes them special now that they're different from how they used to be. So all in all for the T1s, I think you can spend your money better. I don't think there's anything about the T1s that wowed me, drew me into the music and made me think, yes, in this particular genre, they're an absolute winner. As always, I listened to them across quite a wide range of genres and nothing stood out to me as the sweet spot for the T1s. I just think they're a bit of an underwhelming headphone and I'm really sorry to say that because I loved my T1s, my original first gen, so I do have a little bit of a soft spot for them, but I just can't bring myself to love the T1 and that's a bit disappointing for me. So my recommendation, if you're in the market for an open headphone, I'd still say if you can find the money or if you find them on sale, you're better off spending more on something like the Focal Clear than the Bay Dynamic T1. Hopefully you found this review useful. If you did, please do think about hitting the subscribe button and the like button. It really helps the channel to grow, helps me to bring you better content, more comparisons, etc. And don't forget about the affiliate links, my merchandise and the Patreon page that are all linked below as other ways you can support the channel and help me bring better content to you. For now though, I just want to say thanks to Bay Dynamics Australian Distributors for the loan of the T1 and the T5. I hope you found these reviews enjoyable. Happy listening and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound.